In my local Publix, near the checkout lane, there's a stand containing this old form of communication that many of us don't buy anymore, but enjoy to consume. It's the flipping pages of newspapers. Some are named the New York Times, Washington Post, and the local one from my community that usually no one reads. There I can find the news for the day, the opinions of others, columns, and the earlier form of the online's favorite version of a blog. Transitioning into the network sphere where the content is mostly free, I can also find information and opinions written by complete strangers. The difference between these strangers' opinions on the internet and those in the stand near the checkout lane is that I can curate my preferences on the internet side of things in a way that the newspaper stand does not necessarily allow me to. If I'm a conservative near my checkout lane, the probabilities of finding a strictly conservative newspaper that appeals to my every like is rather difficult, given that the stand usually contains a scrutinized version of the truth, one with fact-checking, journalistic standards, and other communication jargon. On the internet, matters diverge. I can find the information that most suits me, and I don't have to even try. The ads from Facebook, Google, and other websites prompt my bias. They actually play around with it and make me more likely to visit blogs that agree with my opinion. Today on Disruptive Adventism, we talk with the two founders of a conservative blog called Fulcrum 7. Let us find out how they started their journey into what is one of the most controversial websites within the Adventist denomination today. Uh, Jerry and I had been involved. This is actually the third internet-based Adventist-oriented magazine that we have been involved with, and uh, it's uh, we were we were both board members of something that became the Compass Magazine, and then we were board members and contributors to a site that was called Advindicate, and finally we uh, started our own magazine in December of 2015 called Fulcrum Seven. So. We think third time's the charm, and uh, we, we think we've got the right formula, and it's been a question of trial and error and experience over the years and uh, learning uh, what works, and uh, we hope it's a blessing to people. The right formula. What exactly is that, you may wonder, as it is increasingly difficult and important to have the right titles, ideas, and content that appeals to your audience. As you visit their page at fulcrum7.com, you encounter an interesting take on the matters of theology, church governance, and current social issues even. So who exactly is Fulcrum 7 intended audience? Good question. We naturally appeal to a more conservative audience, which was our target from the beginning because David and I both realized after a number of years uh, working in Adventist um minimalist publication was that the Adventist grassroots had lost their voice over the last 30 years or so. They really didn't have anywhere to go to be heard, especially on the conservative side of Adventism. Recognizing that, we decided to provide a place where they could come and be heard. There's so many good stories out there, and so many wonderful testimonies, and they don't get heard very often. In this way, by providing Fulcrum 7 as a hub, we provided a central place where these stories can be an encouragement to other people. A conservative audience. What does that even mean in today's environment? Well, if you visit the page, you can evaluate for yourself. Their article titles, I'll give you a couple, such as Beto calls for stripping conservative churches of tax exemption, or LGBTQ activist reveals goal to smash biblical sexuality through education. Or even, Catholic lawyer exposes Pope's alliance with UN for population control. Those are conservative, but of a certain kind. I'll let you be the judge. Let's continue with our story. Well, it's just whatever news of the day we find interesting. Most of it is religious news. Uh... Probably most of it is Adventist news, but not all of it. If there's something interesting that's happening in another denomination, we'll cover it. If it's, if we think it has implications for the Adventist church, or if it's just a particularly striking mainstream news story that's not even religious, we might comment on it. If it, if again, if we think that it 
has implications for what's going on. So it's it's not uh, necessarily only Adventist news. It's kind of just whatever we think is interesting or, or that our our reader base might find interesting. Whatever our audience finds interesting. Well, there you have it. And as we come back, we're going to see what the audience has been saying and if they're satisfied. Thank you for listening to Disruptive Adventism and our conversation with Fulcrum 7. We'll be right back. You have an idea. You want to tell it to the world, but you don't know where to start. That's where Anchor comes in. They have the tools for you to edit, produce, and record your idea right from your phone or computer. It's the easiest way to reach and grow your audience. They publish for you to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all major platforms. And to top it all off, they match you with advertisers so you can earn from your passion and your wonderful idea. So tell me, what are you waiting for? Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started and follow your dream. We're back with more Disruptive Adventism. Thank you for listening. If you want to get the unedited version of this podcast, make sure to go to patreon.com slash disruptive adventism. So what is the response that the audience has had from reading Fulcrum 7? Let's see what they say. Very good question. We've heard from a lot of people. In fact, after three years now, we sit in the place where we get a lot of input from different people. At first, we heard from individuals who were saying, thank you. We used to feel like we were alone, and now we don't feel that way anymore. And so I became aware of an acute sense of alienation amongst a lot of our readers. And so we tried to do something to encourage them, let them know that they're not alone. On the other side of that scale, you'll get people who don't like what we're doing at Fulcrum 7. They feel that it's too conservative or whatever it might be. And sometimes people will respond in a hostile way. We don't get a whole lot of that, but we do get some, Jose. And I've gotten to where I save it in a specific file. It's kind of fun to go back and read through them once in a while. <clears throat> We've had individuals write us, and this is at one end of the spectrum, who have said, you guys are the worst possible people ever with the worst possible publication ever. Pretty much that. On the other side of the scale, far more common is thank you so much for being there, for being available, and for writing these stories, publishing them that have encouraged us. So it's a wide spectrum. I think that spectrum is kind of endemic or at least indicative of the ideological divide in the church. This isn't something that we've asked for or something that we've wanted. None of us want to see division come into the church, but we're ideologically divided right now, and like it or not, I don't think God intended for that to happen, but it has, and so we're here to give people some comfort throughout that trial. Let me add to that that we that's the feedback that we get you know from uh, from our readers, but we know that we're reaching more people than ever comment. We know that many of the people that read it don't comment, and uh, we also know that many church officials are reading it, and they don't comment, and they don't give us any feedback, but we hear that they, that they know what's going on. Feedback. A very necessary thing for ministries, websites, blogs to thrive, and even this podcast, so make sure to review us on Apple iTunes if you're listening. But besides feedback, providing community, providing a place where ideas are heard, conservatives and progressives alike. All of us are people, and we look for that community. And whether you like the content or not from Fulcrum 7, they're providing that community for some of them. A place where they can dialogue and talk. We'll get to that a little bit later. But first, let's see what's the vision that Fulcrum has, at least the editors of Fulcrum, about the current state of the church and the divisory lines that are between us at the moment. What's happening in the church is a reflection of what's happening in the culture at large. There are tremendous uh, changes happening in the culture, in Western culture and throughout the world. These changes are affecting the church as well. They're polarizing not only our nation, but Adventists. 
And as they go one direction or another, it creates tension in the church. You ask about the question of unity. It's a wonderful thing. Unity and truth is what binds us all together. Unity and error is the rope between the drowning man and the steel anchor. I'll leave it at that. I think they're... The ide- I agree with Jerry that the ideological differences are coming from the world because generally we're agreed on, on uh, I, I would say, the liberal wing and the conservative wing of the church are agreed on most of the doctrines of the church. For example, the state of the dead, uh, the Sabbath, those are not things that divide the left wing from the right wing. Um, the things that are that are dividing us now, I think, have to do with Women's ordination, again, which is a cultural thing that stems from the sexual revolution of the late 60s and early 70s, um, cultural changes like that, normalization of homosexuality. Again, that's something post-sexual revolution that's coming in from the world, and that's, again, dividing liberals and conservatives. Um, so it's not, I think most of the doctrines, even the far left and the far right and within the Adventist church are agreed on. Um, I mean, there's... Even the Seventh-day Darwinians don't want to do away with the Sabbath, even though the six-day creation and God resting on the seventh day is the basis for the Sabbath for many of us. Um, we find that uh, you know, sec- uh, secular Jews and even very conservative religious Jews believe in the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath without believing in a six-day creation. So you know, even the what I call the Spectrumites or the left wing of the church are still going to uphold the Sabbath, even when they undermine the foundations of it by promoting uh, Darwinism in the church. So it's really, it's really, I would say that the, the divide that's coming uh, is, is coming from post-sexual revolution, uh, contemporary American culture. But even though that's where it's coming from, that's probably not where it's going to end. It could, I think it could end up, completely dividing the church along a whole range of issues. Whether we end united or divided remains to be seen, but the reality is that both conservative and liberals know that there is something in the air right now, something that can cause our division, and something that can make us united even more. As we come back from our break, we're going to dive into two more areas of Fulcrum 7, anonymity and the comment section. Thank you for listening to Disruptive Adventism. We hope you're enjoying this episode. We'll be right back. This podcast is brought to you by our supporters on patreon.com and coffee.com. Our supporters are the backbone of the podcast, and we are very thankful for all of you. Your contributions allow us to seek the best ideas and disruptors in the world and bring you podcasts that energize, transform, and change your community. We hope you take courage and join our one-time contributors through coffee.com or our monthly ones on patreon.com. You'll get amazing merch and early access to our unedited interviews and produced podcasts. If you want to contribute, hit the links in the description below. And thank you. We're into our final segment with Disruptive Adventism today, and we have been talking with Fulcrum7. One of the last things that we talked about with them was the idea of anonymity. They allow their comments or their writers to be anonymous, as it is a long-standing tradition for American publications, from newspapers to blogs to anything. Sometimes they are written under a pseudonym. And even on this podcast, we have had anonymous guests in order to protect them. So we asked them, why are some of the writers anonymous? This is what they said. The first conventions that we attended, everybody had one burning question on their lips. Who is Church Mouse? (laughs) I said, well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that he's always around. Um, Church Mouse is actually a a semi-humorous creation. He writes on a variety of topics. Got this kind of a rapier British uh, wit about him. Don't hear from him all the time, but he writes occasionally. He's taken a break for a while here in the last five months. He's written a couple of things. Uh, News Hound is just a kind of a pseudo name that we've created for an individual that writes on news items. 
Now, having said that, and focusing on those two, 95% of the articles that we publish on Fulcrum 7 do have their names attached to them. They come from specific individuals. So these two are just a small departure from that practice. Do you want to say something, David? Well, I, I think there's a long tradition of, and certainly in America, going back to the revolution, to the Revolutionary War of people publishing under pseudonyms uh, like Cato um, or what have you. Um, and I think it just gives you a little more freedom to raise issues without being attacked personally. Um, and, and, and there's people that need that protection because they may be working for the church or they may, work, may be working in a sensitive job. Or they, they may not want, you know, they may not want to get fired from their church employment or whatever. You know, there's, there's various reasons for people, uh, writing under a pseudonym and, you know, as, as long as it's not, you know, as long as you're not hiding behind anonymity to make sort of pointed attacks on people, uh, I, I don't see a problem with it. If people feel the need for anonymity, it's, it's, I want to give them that, uh, freedom as long as it's not, you know, sort of being used to, to, uh, defame and attack. Um, then I don't see a problem with it. And, and there's just some people that feel like, if they use their name, then it becomes about them and they don't want that. They want it to be about the issue that they're writing about rather than, you know, a personal thing. So, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why we do it. But again, I would say over 90% of our articles are, 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 are signed. They're by, a, they're by a named person. Whether you agree or not, and especially now in our culture of transparency and openness, it's a little bit difficult to swallow the pill of anonymity. But sometimes it's necessary in order to protect people, as long as it's being done to protect people. So I invite you to read those articles that are anonymous on Fulcrum 7 and evaluate if they are using that only to protect themselves or, as they said, to defame others. And you be the judge, whether they are using that anonymity in a way that is for protection and not just to run away from criticism or feedback. One of the last areas we discussed with Fulcrum 7 is the idea of fundamentalism. As you read their blog, you may think that they are a little bit more conservative than your regular conservative individual. And I asked them if they think that they are turning fundamentalist and what was their reaction to that? Let me say that I, I don't see the term fundamentalism as necessary, necessarily a pejorative because the term really emerged in the early 20th century as a reaction to liberalism and as a reaction to liberals saying that many of the stories in the Bible were not true, the stories of the flood, the stories of miracles, of people being raised from the dead. Um, and the fundamentalists just came back to say, we can trust Scripture. We can believe Scripture. We can uh, accept it as being the inspired Word of God. Uh, now, Seventh-day Adventists, we don't... There, there were the, the classical fundamentals, and they had five fundamentals, and I don't remember all five of them, but... Uh, I remember that Adventists believe, agree with four of the five. The only, the only one of the five fundamentals that we don't agree with is verbal inspiration. We believe, you know, based on Ellen White and her teachings and, uh, our, our idea of inspiration is not word for word inspiration. Uh, we believe that the Bible writers and Ellen White were God's penmen, not his pen. So we don't see word for word or verbal inspiration. We believe in thought or idea inspiration that the, the, the writers of scripture were moved by the Holy Spirit to write, but the actual words are not dictated by a higher power. So that's our, our subtle differences on the nature of inspiration, verbal inspiration versus nonverbal or idea or the words being inspired versus the writer being inspired. I mean, this is the only area where we actually disagree with the fundamentalists. The other four fundamentals were like the virgin birth and the miracles and, you know, things like that. So, um, in my view, fu the, the, fun the fundamentalists were a healthy reaction to liberalism that was coming into the, ma to mainline Protestantism as a result of, uh, in part as a result of Darwinism, as a result of the, 
the late 19th century and early 20th century liberalism coming into the Christian church. So to my mind, fundamentalism is not a pejorative. We just disagree with them because we don't believe in verbal inspiration. But the, the other things, the other fundamentals we believe in. So, um, you know, I, I don't view it as a pejorative. David doesn't see it as a pejorative. Jerry doesn't as well. We have his response on the unedited version if you want to check it out. But one thing that we cannot leave you without in this episode is the comment section. And this is not reserved for Fulcrum 7 only. This happens at every comment section and every website, most likely. It can get pretty nasty. It can get difficult. And the reality is that there are opinions shared there that may not reflect what the writers write about, but the opinions of others. And that's what they're invited for. But what about moderation? Are they moderating? What do they have to say about that? I tend to be laissez-faire, you know, unless there's something just outrageous, unless it's like obscene or the view's bad language or something. I tend to let people have their say. Um, I know we get criticized sometimes because, you know, we we have a core group and and, and maybe one or two members of the core group are kind of crusty, sour pusses and people don't like them and, and they don't like that. But, uh, you know, we think of them as part of the community and, and, and we know they don't. We, we, we think they don't have bad intent. We think they mean well. Um, but, you know, but you, you just got to realize that, you know, one of the things that we do is we, we do have a forum and we do allow people to express their opinions. And we don't always agree with everything our commenters say. Um, but it's uh, it's hard to know where to, 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 to draw the line. And uh, sometimes you, you know, I, I my pet peeve is the single issue people. Um, there are people that just have one single issue and that's all they want to, and everything becomes, you know, it's like if you're a hammer, everything becomes a nail, you know, <laughs> and, and, and they're the single issue people bother me. And we've actually banned several of them. I mean, you know, I think we're, we're pro-life, Jerry and I are, but some of the anti-abortion people are so monomaniacal that we've banned them. Um, and there's one guy whose his sole issue is original sin. We banned him. So, I mean, the single issue people, the people that cannot broaden out and, and speak to different issues, they're more likely to get banned than just somebody who disagrees with us, but who's able to stay on topic or, or who's able to actually speak to the article that the comment thread is underneath, you know, who are actually able to you know, interact with people. If they can interact, to me, that's such a relief. Good point, David. We believe in self-governance, and if people don't do it, we do it for them, usually. But it's a big job, especially when you've gone from nothing to over 700,000 unique viewers in three years' time. We do our best. We do our best. Could we do better? I think so. And with that, dear listener, we hope that you have a roundup of what Fulcrum 7 stands for. So next time you read their website, you can hold them to the standard of what they have said. As a close, I want to share a little bit of what Jerry shared with me about what is the important thing, even when we're divided, even when we disagree. What's the most important thing that we can do today to remain civil and to regard others? with respect to date most of those conversations have happened kind of spontaneously at fall council meetings where spectrum and fulcrum are sitting side by side with each other in the press box at fall council for the last several years and that's actually a good place to be and when mark fenley stands up and he says i want you to turn to the person next to you and pray together it's a perfect opportunity, and so I prayed with Bonnie Dwyer a number of times. Um, an individual I won't name came by <clears throat> afterwards with a, I wouldn't call it a smirk, but almost on his face, and said, boy, Spectrum and Fulcrum together, what a, how are you guys getting along? I said, we were doing great till you came. <laughs> um, I have a a good measure of professional respect for Bonnie, having sat next to her and done our work together side by side. We may not agree on everything, but there's one thing for sure, Jose. We need to learn how to love people with whom we may disagree. 
that is something you can take into the heavenly kingdom with you. And all these differences and divides down here at that point won't matter so much. Now truth will matter, because truth will either get you in the door or it'll keep you out if you abandon it. So truth always matters, but how we treat each other matters equally as much. You've been listening to Disruptive Adventism. We hope that today's topic helped you to think and change something about your practices, about your faith, about your Adventism. If you want to subscribe, make sure to go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast. We'll be there. And make sure to give us a review if you like what you're listening to. If you want to support, make sure to go to patreon.com slash disruptiveadventism. It helps us pay our bills and produce the content that you're listening to. And if you want to socialize, make sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, or on Twitter, and hit us up whenever you need anything. We'll be there to support you. Thank you for listening today. We hope you join us next time. And as always, we invite you to be disruptive.